Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the third in our series of Looking Ahead seminars. My name is Tim Levy and I'm the Chairman and Head of Business Advisory at Preston Reeves. We are one of the top 25 firms of accountants, tax advisors and financial planners in the UK. And we're part of the Creston network of firms with offices internationally. We started these seminars as the pandemic hit, and it's one of the ways that Creston Reeves have been guiding our clients through what is happening to what we hope will be a brighter future. This seminar is focused on the next 18 months, what's happening and what you should do to deal with it. This webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent to you by the end of the day along with a brief feedback survey and an offer to join a follow-on free taster session, which is an introduction to a subscription programme that will guide you through the next 18 months in real time. I'll explain that a little more at the end. Please feel free to use the question facility as we go along. And thank you to those people who've already submitted questions. I've got a couple which I'll be uh, putting to the panellists as we go along. As you can see, there are three other presenters today. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Mark Atwood, one of my fellow partners at Creston Reeves. Good morning, Mark. Please introduce yourself. Tell us what you'll be covering later. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be covering the maximization of cash in 2021 and actually uh, trying to bring in some real life examples just to bring that to life. So I look forward to um, speaking to you all then. Thank you, Mark. Also with us is Belinda Collins from Be Heard Marketing Agency. Good morning, Belinda. Good morning, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be covering routes to market and helping you build out some campaigning assets and how you can take those to market to engage your audience. That's great. Thank you, Belinda. And first up is Darren Sherlaw from the Bob Group. Darren is the founder of the Business of Brand with Lindsay Boyd. But in addition to being a business guru, he's a mathematician, former fund manager, and a special relevance to us today, an economic commentator. I was in the room just over a year ago when Darren predicted that 2020 was going to be a tough year for the global economy. Darren, you were right then. Can you now help us to understand what's likely to happen to the economy over the next 18 months? Uh, thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. Uh, and can I just thank uh, yourself and Mark from Creston Reeves for inviting me today. Uh, you uh, have asked me to cover economy in uh, the next 10 minutes, so this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour. Uh, but uh, before we start uh, on that conversation, I'm assuming all of us, Belinda, are watching the amazing mum on the background there. That, uh, <laughs> And uh, we've done lots of Zoom calls, obviously, since the recession has started, and I think that's the best background I've seen so far. So you get that price. Um, in terms of uh, recessions and all that sort of stuff, yeah, I've been, uh, ever since I left the fund management world, I've been out uh, in, uh, basically doing presentations all around the world now for the last 20 years on economy and how that impacts on businesses. Um, and uh, what I've asked Patrick to do is uh, throw up a few diagrams here um, for you. And I'm going to show you how to Google all of this for yourself. Um, and so uh, if you're listening to this and taking notes, the first thing I would encourage you to do is um, jump onto Google and uh, Google the words uh, last 100 years of the stock market. Um, now, this one you can see is the Dow Jones, but it doesn't really matter which one it is, whether it's this one or the FTSE. Um, and the important thing is when you do this is that you get what's called a logarithmic scale. And that means that the bottom half of that chart is on a different scale to the top half of the chart. Um, so from the bottom up to about halfway on the right hand side there, you can see a thousand points. And then suddenly it goes from a thousand points up to about 20,000 points uh, at the top half of the chart. Now, the purpose of that is to expand or blow out uh, the 100 year part. So you can actually see the charts going back to the 1920s. Um, and if you don't look for a logarithmic scale, you will just see a straight line. Um, the highlighter of what I want to point out is hopefully you can see the dark black line there and it's a stepped uh, process. Um, and so what we can see is about 18 years of growth followed by 14 years of flatlining. Uh, followed by 18 years of growth and another 14 years of flatlining. And uh, this has been going on for hundreds of years. 
Um, and I've re religiously followed this 14, 18 year cycle now forever and a day. Um, and the important dates there, Tim, are um, 1981 was the bottom of that 18 year cycle. From 1981 to 1999, 18 years, we went on a growth curve. Um, 1999 to 2013 was 14 years of growth. And so from 2013, you add another 18 years and we're actually in a growth cycle. And so that's 2013 to 2031 are the key dates. Um, in every 18 year growth cycle, if you look back to 1981, um, about six years to seven years into that growth cycle, we get a small correction, as it's called in the fund world. Um, it ends up being a large economic correction and it's called an L-shaped recession. Uh, there's three types of recessions. There's an L and there's a V and there's a W. Um, and in uh, six to seven years into that 18 year cycle, we always end up with an L-shaped recession. So the last time we had one was 1987, uh, six years after 1981. And so as you know, Tim, I sat with your group about 12 months ago and I said, if you add six years to 2013, uh, then to the back end of 2019 and going into 2020, we'll get an L-shaped recession. Um, and an L-shaped recession lasts for about 18 months. So we'll take you through that in a moment. But all of this, as you know, I've been predicting for over 10 years um, that by about this stage, we'd be going into a hardcore uh, L-shaped recession. And so the specific dates, if you want them, uh, we're talking about March 20 through to September 21. And then from September 21, uh, for 10 years, all the way through to 2031, will actually be 10 years of growth. So if you want the good news, if you were listening, uh, we've got 10 years of growth ahead of us. If you want the bad news, we've got about another 15 months of hard times before we get there. Uh, Patrick, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, the next thing to do is Google the words economic clock. Uh, clocks are one of my favorite things to look at because they're cycles. Um, and they go around and around and they're perfectly predictable. Uh, I just described the 14 plus 18 year period, that's 32 years, and you can apply the 32 years to this thing called an economic clock to determine where we are economically in a cycle. And so on this clock, on the outside of the clock, you can actually see asset classes. So if you look at 12 o'clock, by way of example, you can see real estate prices there. At six o'clock, you can also see real estate prices. And at 12 o'clock, they're going up. And at six o'clock, they're going down. At one o'clock, we can see interest rates going up. At seven o'clock, interest rates are going down. So as I described, the clock is a cycle. On the inside of the clock, we have the economy. And so in the first quarter, you can see the economy is in slump mode. Uh, bottom down there on the right hand side, we end up in deeper type gloom periods. Uh, then we go into recovery. And so about seven o'clock, it's called an hesitant, uneven recovery. And finally, at about nine o'clock, we go into what's called general recovery. Now, the trick here is that most people think because we're in a recession that we must be over there at about four or five o'clock. We're actually not. We're at a quarter past nine on this clock over 32 years. This L-shaped recession is just a recovery uh, component of uh, a, a wider 18 year period of growth. Um, if you look at nine o'clock specifically, it says commodity prices will go up um, and that is just about to happen majorly. You can see gold and silver has changed a lot in the last uh, short period of time. Um, and if you look at the ratio of commodity prices to uh, the share market index, then commodity prices are at their lowest point in 120 years. So commodity prices to the stock market are at an all time low and will go up. Um, some commodity prices have already boomed significantly. So rhodium, for example, is up 152% on the last 12 months mark. Um, so you should have bought rhodium about 12 months ago. There you go. Um, so where are we going? We're into this boom. After quarter past nine, you'll see uh, we've got general recovery, strong recovery, and then the boom. Uh, the boom specifically will be the period of 2026 to 2031. Um, and so this is economic clock, if you want to Google that. 
And then uh, last uh, slide there to show you is the L-shaped recession, Tim. Um, I'm sure um, everyone is uh, keeping an eye on the newspapers and all that sort of stuff. And uh, most of what you read uh, in the papers is that this is a V-shaped recession. Um, it's not. Uh, V-shaped recessions occur about every seven to eight years. Um, and, uh, and if I just use my pens very nicely for you in a moment. Um, so this is what I call a V-shape. It's phonetic. It's exactly the same shape as a V in the alphabet. Um, and what you've got here is an economy in slide. It's a 45 degree angle. You can see it on the charts. Um, an economy in slide, and it's very slow. You just sort of slowly drift into a recession. You hit the bottom, and this is called the bounce, and you come out of the recession and you go back this way. Um, that's called a V. Um, now, the reason why this is an L, as you can see on the chart there, is because that's an L. Um, and in an L, what happens is, is the markets crash very quickly. And what we had here was the markets falling by about 30 odd percent in the space of three days. Um, and so the markets crashed, as you can see on that uh, screen there, that red line going straight down. Um, and when the line goes straight down, as it did in October 1987, um, and has done this time March 2020, um, what we're going into is what's called an L-shaped recession. There will not be a bounce, it will not happen quickly. Um, what we've got is an 18 month flat period at the bottom there um, and that 18 months uh, mark occurs in three phases so the first phase is what i call the shock phase and it's a little bit like going into a trauma so if you think of a period uh, when someone loses a relative or something uh, what you do is you go into that trauma state of shock and when we get an l-shaped recession because it happens so quickly people go oh my god what's happened um, and overnight, businesses are out of business overnight. In this case, we had the pandemic and there was a lockdown period. Um, and business people tend to go into this shock phase, as do consumers. And everything kind of stops for a moment. Um, that shock phase lasts for three months. So we're talking about March this year through to June this year. So we're actually already past the shock phase. Um, and then we go into the next six months. And so they're talking about June this year through to December this year. Um, and it's called the recovery phase. And it's actually recovery from the shock. It's not an economic recovery. We're actually, we're in gloomy times still during this period. But people start to go, oh, I think I've got my mind around this now. I need to start acting. I need to change some things. I need to innovate some things. I need to get on with my life. And they start to try and work out what to do. And that's called the recovery phase. Um, in society, what you'll see in the recovery phase uh, gen generically is, is, is a lot of disruption. So we'll see people marching on streets. You'll see people getting upset with governments. Uh, during this phase, people have got to blame somebody for this recession. And so uh, with no one else to blame, we tend to blame the governments, for example. Um, and so you'll see blame coming out in the press. Uh, you'll see disruption occurring across people. Um, and what you start to see then is um, the publication of actual data. So the problem economically, Tim, is that uh, the government and that only issues statistics quarterly, generally in arrears for a lot of things like GDP. And so what, uh, what will happen is we will have gone into the recession in March, but the government won't recognize that we're in a recession for a further six months. So recession is actually two quarters of negative growth back to back. Um, so if we go March through to September, then the government won't actually announce we're in a recession until October. Um, and then you'll see in the newspapers, we're in a recession. And then you'll see another layer of panic occur amongst consumers and people. Um, and the reality is we've already been in the recession for six months. That's how we got to two quarters of negative growth. Um, a depression, by the way, is four quarters of negative growth. Um, and so uh, if we achieve that, then by March next year, come April, um, the world would be announcing uh, we're in a depression. And what I try and explain to business people is that you've already lived through it by the time the government gets around to announcing it. Um, how good is the government and the press and all that sort of stuff at this uh, communication? Uh, well, in 08, 09, when I was helping business people through that recession, um, I kept saying to them, 
This is the worst one since uh, since 1929. Um, and we actually had, Mark, six quarters of negative growth. Now you need four quarters for it to be called a de depression. We had six quarters back to back of negative growth and it got called a great recession. Aaron, we heard, we heard you say there that uh, there's constant trends through through the last however many years, a uh, hundred odd years. Is the pandemic any different to what's happened before? Uh, so what a pandemic does is, um, so we already had, if, in fact, if you Google, will there be a recession in 2020? Um, you'll see a whole load of people uh, advising that there will be a recession in 2020 before we knew about the pandemic. And so the economic fundamentals where we were already heading towards the recession, uh, what the pandemic does is increases the intensity and the speed of it effectively. So we dive deeper than we would have done without the pandemic. And that's due to things like the lockdown. Um, if you Google the words wartime economy, um, when this came out in March, I told people to keep an eye out for something called wartime economy. And what that means is the supply chains are all changing as they do in wartime. So if you think back to uh, stories of World War II, for example, governments came out and reorganized the manufacturing sectors to start building war machines instead of, you know, stuff for the houses and that. And they're doing the same right now, but instead of war, it's for NHS and things like that. So you're seeing an economy changing significantly. Um, a good example in this country is uh, the price um, of flour has been going up in the supermarkets, and yet there's loads and loads and loads of flour. And so we've got uh, clients in the food industry who tell me there's more than enough flour. And what we don't have is enough machines to put that flour into one kilo packets. We've got loads of machines to put it into big 25 kilo packets to send to the restaurants, but they're all closed. So there's loads of flour, but not enough machines. So the supply chains are changing. Um, pandemic, uh, the last time you had a global pandemic, a proper global pandemic, um, as opposed to localized stuff, uh, was actually 1918. It's called the Spanish flu. Obviously killed millions of people around the world. Um, it lasted for three years, uh, 1918 to 1920. Uh, we went through three cycles then, so there was a first wave, a second wave, and a third wave. Um, and straight after that, from 1920 to 1929, we had 10 years of spectacular growth, which ended up being called the Roaring Twenties. Tim? I have, I have, I have seen um, just recently that a number of the microbrewers have moved into um, hand sanitizer as well. So um, again, that backs up what you've been saying. Mm. Yep. Yep. More time economy in action. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Darren. And as Darren said, you can do your own research on this. I, I did after June last year and I went back to about 1935 and ended up doing my own diagram, which I showed a number of people. And I've had a number of people come up to me afterwards and say, that was amazing. I've got your, it looks like it's written by a six year old, but you've signed and dated it. And how have you done that? And I said, well, it wasn't, it actually wasn't me. There's someone bright in the background who's doing this. Anyway, brilliant. Thank you for that, Darren. Uh, yeah. Now I'd like to hand over to Mark Atwood, who's going to talk to us about maximising your cash and getting the numbers right. So, uh, as, as Tim said, I'm going to be talking about maximising cash over the next 10 minutes. It's going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour. But um, just reflecting back on what Darren said, actually, let's just start from the beginning. Actually, I saw and was speaking to my clients quite regularly and exactly what Darren described there, um, there was an element of shock. Um, and what they all did is they dive right down into the detail. And they all started looking at minimizing costs. And their mindset was, we need cash to survive. And again, the instant response to that is, in some cases, was we're not going to pay anyone and we're going to sit on and build up our lump of cash, which is an interesting strategy when actually you're going to need these suppliers going forward. So there's a bit of a payoff there in terms of um, paying suppliers and keeping them happy. Um, but actually, the major focus was they had their heads down. There was an internal focus. And so they were looking right down into the micro detail rather than looking externally into the macro or the wider strategy. But as Darren said just then, this won't last forever. So 
what we need to remember is our micro strategy and our macro strategy have to align and we need to make sure that we're maximizing all pop- opportunities to maximize our cash so that when the time happens, we have the cash available to take the opportunities. Um, the virus has actually created so many challenges for us, but it's created other opportunities, as, as Darren mentioned um, there. And these are driven by the need to fulfill a need. And also, the virus has driven various changes. So not that long ago, video conferencing wasn't that well used. And actually, how that affects your company now, we could be looking at potentially interacting with clients a lot more. Therefore, if we think about that through to the cash, actually, you might not be traveling as much. You might be able to get around more um, meetings in a day. Therefore, identifying more sales opportunities throughout that day, maximizing your sales. So uh, going back to actually how to maximize your cash. First of all, we really need to understand where you are. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have ever looked at your business cash working capital cycle, but I think personally that's where we'd start. So we'd calculate that identify where you are, where, what trends there are within your um, working capital cycles, and then start to break down those areas. Um, ideally, you'd already be doing the, ba- the basics. Um, it's a bit of a given. The, when I say the basics, I mean uh, making sure that you collect your trade debtors on time, ensure that you're utilizing any credit lines that, you're, um, that are made available to you, but also in terms of your stocks for some of you who actually buy and sell uh, items, identifying those stock lines that are slow moving and therefore you don't have to hold as much. Um, When I say the basics, I assume that people do them. However, I had a client who phoned up early um, early in lockdown, was struggling with cash, and then when we started talking, they'd let their debtors book just run away with them. And they had a million pounds worth on debtors and their turnover was only actually three million. So keeping, keeping on top of the basics, as I say, um, is key. However, those who are going to be really, really successful need to do more than that. Um, what I'm going to do now is just run through a number of areas that I think would be of interest to you. Um, it's mainly focused around profit and loss and therefore maximizing the potential cash out of the trading side rather than going out and getting loans or equity for investment. So we all know the word furlough now. Um, We didn't at the start of the year, but what it's done is it's put a huge spotlight on our staffing. And speaking to my clients, actually what they did was they started looking at their staff pool in a different way, Um, quite often in human nature you go to someone you say are you busy and they always say yes and i have it and tim will have it here Um, whenever you ask anyone are you busy the answer is definitely yes however actually starting to break down their role and looking into productivity um, sometimes what you identify is that there are those who are working extremely hard and efficiently and others that aren't and so balance loading across those people can create capacity within your machine or within your firm. And so where you otherwise might have gone out and taken another member of staff on, assuming that everybody is busy, actually looking at what you've got can create additional um, resource. In, in some cases, I've seen that actually identifying where, where productivity is lower and balance loading it across creates another 30% of additional capacity within your business, which obviously means that you're not then taking on additional members of staff and therefore maximizing your cash in that particular scenario. Um, Structure as well, ensuring that the touch points that you have on a regular basis aren't as widespread. Looking at how your... um, how you're communicating with the people within your businesses is key. It's got to be efficient. Looking ahead as well as to what training will be needed. 
Darren mentioned the wartime economy has diversified lots and lots of businesses. If you are part of that um, crew who are diversifying, actually, do you have the skill set to do that and deliver it in an, in an effective way? Uh, we move on to efficiency. So productivity is one thing, efficiency and process is another. Um, one thing I would say is when you're in investing in efficient processes, it has a double effect. It can increase your margins, so therefore increasing the throughput of profit and therefore the amount of cash that will fall out the bottom. But in having efficient processes, it's an asset within your business. So actually, not only are you increasing your throughput of profits, you're increasing the value of your business. Some people out there would be interested in overlaying that fisher process potentially within their business. Um, I've, got, I've got an example there where one of my clients has actually gone to one of their uh, external suppliers and told them and, that they would no longer would be using them because they're going to give notice. And what they've done is they've gone back to the external supplier, run through their process, realize that there's actually significant improvements that could be in, um, introduced and it is taking that in-house. That's going to give them a further income stream that they were, they're then paying for originally, which will then give them further income into their business and then through to bottom line. Um, sales and sales and margin. Um, as I mentioned right at the start, um, a lot of my clients are looking at costs. And what that means that really no one is safe. So if everybody is looking at costs and you're supplying all of your customers, they, they are looking at your cost to see whether, one, it's good value, whether your quality of service, or just seeing what's out there. Um, it provides you with opportunities to win new work, but also you need to understand why your clients are staying with you and have been with you to continue with um, on that vein. Um, so understanding where your focus is as well, whether you're on sales growth or margin growth. If you think of it as a bucket, sometimes you hit capacity and you can't grow anymore without significant investment within your factory or your headcount. And there's only so much you can push out of your assets. Therefore, normally the first thing a lot of people to do, do is switch straight to strategic growth, which is they then go and purchase another site or build another factory. Actually, the step in between is margin so that you need to start looking at process, efficiency, potentially where you're buying uh, raw materials and things like that from to ensure that your margins are increasing, which will then give you a good level of cash to invest into the next stage of growth. Um, as, as all business owners know, um, you need a, an effective sales pipeline, um, but we all spend a lot on advertising. And what I tend to see is this consistent um, investment within advertising and no one ever really questions it that much, um, generally due to the fact that people are worried about dropping um, sales leads. Um, but actually, if you start breaking down where your sales leads are coming from, what will happen is you can identify then what expenditure you're incurring and start matching it in a different way. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, if, if you're always spending money on a sales force, but actually a lot of your leads come from an online source, there's a mismatch between your expenditure and where your leads are coming from. You can gradually then move that across into um, a more online-based um, sales technique and that will create further leads for you. Um, Darren will be talking about product innovation, but actually I have seen examples of where product innovation and continually investing within your business is vital. You have to understand that the key 
um, the, the key fundamental in business is income follows asset. You can't have income without having something to sell or in Creston Reeves' case, uh, an accountancy background. So we've invested in ourselves to create income. Um, the example I'd like to tell you about is one of my, one of a potential client I went and saw, um, they showed me their figures straight away. And I asked them, one of the first questions I asked them was, are you struggling with sales post year end? And they, they said, oh, what, why, do you, why do you say that? And this was a business that most people would think a cutting edge um, in, in technology. And actually what was clear from their numbers was they hadn't invested enough within their product. They, their R&D had completely fallen away year on year. And when I started asking questions, their, their, their management's focus had been entirely taken away. And they were focused on a, an actual move from, um, from one site to another. So rather than focusing on R&D and, and investing in the product, they'd actually invested in a site which is a longer term strategic asset. However, all of their competitors caught up with them, which saw quite a significant drop in sales. And again, once, that, once those sales started dropping away, they had quite a large fixed base overhead with a new property on, on board and um, they started struggling. So what, what I'm saying there is ensure that um, investing in your product is vital in this, in this stage, because what we're doing is we're gearing up for what we know is not gonna last forever, and we'll move out of this recession at some point, and so you need to be in the best place possible to do that. Ensure that your cash is um, maximized. It's not gonna be a magic bullet for one particular, in one particular area. It's gonna be a number of different um, aspects, and it's, it's gonna be a collection of actions that will give you the opportunity to invest in areas when they come about. Um, thank you very much. I'll pass back to Tim. Thank you, Mark. Um, Darren, just before we move on to product innovation, we had uh, both Tanya and David ask pretty much the same question, which was we talked about the first two phases of the L-shaped recession. Um, so we talked about shock and recovery, and they wanted to know what the third one was, which covers the nine months from January 21. It's, a, it's always a good question. Um, I was trying to get people through to Christmas alive, but uh, yeah, from January through to September uh, 21, uh, we're in what's called a rebuild phase. So we have shock phase, recovery phase, and that first nine months of the 18 months um, is really tough. And uh, the best way I try to help you through that is to bring awareness to the fact that that's what's happening. Um, if I can encourage you to understand that you're already in a recession, uh, the numbers are already showing us we're actually in the worst depressions for 300 years, so just accept that, that's where we are. Um, but from January onwards, uh, the world comes back out of the cave and starts to rebuild. And that's the phase Mark just spoke about, where we're like, now how do we invest back into things? Uh, how do we launch new products? How do we innovate? Uh, we're in the rebuild phase. Um, and what I did, I have been telling people in a business context is uh, your focal point is September 21, September next year. And specifically, what do you want your business to look like in that year, on that date, September 21? Um, because from there onwards, we've got 10 years of growth. Um, and what you really want to be is ready to grow from that point onwards, September 21 onwards. Um, and that means the nine months there, Tim, uh, heading into next year is the important rebuild phase. Good question. Okay, lovely. Um, so we did a pre-seminar survey. So thank you to everyone who replied to that. And we did ask um, people whether they had innovated already in the last three months or not. And uh, it was a fairly even split between those two. So 50% had innovated quickly and 50% uh, hadn't, maybe because they didn't need to. We then also asked, and what are you intending to do from here on in? And then we had a majority of people who were saying, yes, they would be innovating from here going forwards. So uh, I think, uh, Darren, you were going to give us something on product innovation and give people a steer on how to go about that. 
Yeah, so um, thanks again. And uh, this is the five minutes on what to do about the economy. So we've spoken about economy. Uh, Mark's spoken about the need to get the maximum amount of cash that you can across this uh, recession. And then this is the topic of, uh, and leading into Belinda, of what do we do about all of this now? Um, and uh, the word innovation always comes up around recession time. Um, and it's one of those words that don't really mean a lot in its own right. So I just try to turn it into what do you need to change in your business to maximize growth and cash across the recession. Um, and I have uh, about 200 odd people now, Tim, uh, on our program, uh, which is a, a week by week program helping people across this recession. And if you ask the, all of those people, uh, what are they innovating? Um, it actually falls into three categories. So instead of innovation, can we just talk about the three categories for a minute of businesses out there? Um, there's a category uh, where some people have been massively affected by the recession. I'm talking restaurants and uh, manufacturing plants and stuff that have that have overnight, you know, airlines and hotels and all sorts of things that have been overnight impacted hugely by this. Uh, we had one client on uh, on the program that was doing 23 million of revenue walking into the recession, and two weeks later was turning over zero, like 23 million to zero, like that's extreme. Um, but why? Um, what happened to them? Well, they were in the charity sector, and they used to go on door knock um, to raise 23 million pounds a year of revenue. Um, and when there was no door knocking allowed anymore, their revenues went to zero. Um, so if you're in that situation, what you're doing is pivoting your business and you may have already done this because we're three months into this recession now. Um, and if you're pivoting your business that quickly, um, it's normally because you're changing your core product, as I call it, um, what you do every day, what you sell to the client every day. Um, you may have had to already change that significantly. Um, some other businesses are not in the category where they've been uh, hugely affected directly by revenue. Um, and I'm talking a lot of accounting firms here, Tim. Um, what's, what's happened to a lot of accounting firms is actually you've got more work than you, you could cope with. Um, people ringing up saying, what does furlough mean and what are all these new rules and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so some businesses have got clients, but the clients are now demanding a lot more from those businesses than they were prior to going into the recession. Um, and what happens to those sort of businesses, as you highlighted, Mark, is their margins get hit quite a lot. So they have to put on extra resources to service the clients and then put pricing pressure across a recession normally means they can't charge more. And so some businesses move across the recession um, in a state of really struggling from a cash perspective or a margin growth perspective, but they might still be in business. So they're stable at one level and struggling at another level. Um, and they need to innovate as well, but they do not need to innovate the core business. What they need to innovate is the customer journey and they need to innovate their pricing. And the key one there is the pricing that will change the strategy completely. Um, and the third category uh, is some people uh, who are in business and who are actually growing because of the recession. So we've got a client in the telco industry and he helps small business owners with things like broadband. Um, and yeah, I chatted to him last week and we were having a good giggle about uh, every time you go on a Zoom call or one of these calls and your broadband at home doesn't work, it causes all sorts of chaos. Um, and he's put in place a system where uh, you have three providers now through his network. And so, you know, if you're on Virgin and it drops out, Sky automatically comes in and so you never drop out of a Zoom call. Um, and his business is booming, as you could imagine. He's growing at 100 mile an hour right now. Um, and he's come up with some other innovation. For example, uh, he does a lot of voice recording stuff. Um, and he worked out that people couldn't go to church as soon as we went into lockdown. So he approached the churches and started putting sermons um, on voice record. And he has signed up 75 churches in about two weeks um, offering <laughs> sermons online. And his business is booming. So some people innovate and they're getting a lot of growth. Innovation to me in that space um, means that those people are in a position where they can do mergers and, and acquisitions. And so I would say, before you try and get lost in innovation, work out who you are, what type of business are you in? Are you really struggling because you've been hit hard? 
Um, or are you still in business, but you're really struggling with margins, or are you actually in growth mode, and so you've got a chance to innovate and do something a little bit more aggressive, like some merger and acquisition activity. Um, when you get to there, um, the, the vast majority of businesses do not need to innovate the core business, their core product line across the recession. Most of us need to innovate our customer journey. What do I mean by that? Uh, in, in an ideal world, I would tell you to go back to your existing customer base, re-engage them, find out what they're dealing with, they're struggling with, and the innovation ideas will come out. Um, for example, we have a client who's a business club here in the UK. They have 1,200 small businesses in their club. Uh, the recession hit and they phoned me and said, what do we do? And I said, tell your seven salespeople to stop selling. Stop, stop looking for new people in to go into the club. They're just going to spend the next 18 months knocking on doors and people saying, oh, I don't need to join a business club. And I said, just get your sales guys now to go and phone the whole 1,200 businesses you've got on your books and ask them where they're at and what help they need. Um, and that business club last month had its highest monthly revenue that they've ever had. Um, not taking on any more customers, but refocusing the seven people. So sometimes innovation isn't this big idea, Tim. Sometimes it doesn't have to be, you know, go and save the world and cure cancer and all this sort of stuff. Sometimes it's just changing the way you're running the business. And Mark gave us some good examples then of changing your staffing structures to find extra capacity. Um, if, if you go deeper into that, then around customer journey, you're looking for how can you maximize the number of new contacts that you've got by September next year? That's what we're really looking for. It's how do you maximize the number of people? So in our own business, what we did was we put a Facebook group together. It was a closed group. Uh, we invited just 100 of the 3,500 businesses that go through our school programs into the closed group. And then we started running webinars. And within three weeks, we had 1,200 businesses in there. That's 1,100 new contacts that we didn't have before uh, that we can talk to. And our business is not trying to sell to them. What we're trying to do is engage them. So by September next year, we'll have some new customers to talk to once we go into the growth phase. So it's about getting a little bit strategic. And last point on innovation I would make, Tim, is um, more market share changes hands in a recession than it ever does in a boom. You get a lot of growth in booms, but more market share changes hands at the bottom of an economic cycle than at the top of an economic cycle. And that changes hands because innovation can occur at a consumer level, meaning people change product, or it can occur at an industry level where people are looking for gaps in their industries right now and working out how to change the whole industry. And that's where merger acquisition opportunities occur. Um, and sometimes it occurs at a societal level. And uh, the biggest changes in society always occur during wartime economy and pandemics. This is the opportunity to look for gaps at a societal level and see if you can fit your business into one of those gaps. Brilliant. Thank you, Darren. And finally, the last presentation um, is now Belinda, who's going to be talking to us about exploring the routes to market. I am indeed. Thank you very much, Tim. So thank you all. I think you've done a lot of listening. I'm going to make you do a little bit of work now, uh, but I just want to give you some context first. So indeed, what Darren's absolutely talking about is engaged data within a business. So the number of contacts that you have within your business and how engaged they are within your business. Before I start talking about routes to market, I just want to relay a conversation I had quite recently um, with a, a company who was saying, well, you know, we don't want to market at the moment. We've got no spend. We don't, we don't want to market to anybody. Uh, we don't want to spend any money on advertising. And actually, there's a really pertinent point there. Advertising is just a very, very small part of marketing. And what we're actually doing in these times, moving from shock into recovery and then into rebuild, is we want to build the engagement that we have with our customers. We want to get to know them more intimately. We want to know where they are in their buying cycle with us. And we want to build trust in that relationship. The more engaged data, the more contacts we have within our business, the easier it is to then move into the growth stage in terms of them being able to transact and um, interact with those businesses. 
So one of the first questions I'll ask you is, who are you targeting? Who do you want to target? And why do you want to target them? And sometimes this helps, you can write these elements down. Sometimes this helps to really categorize them. So who is your core target audience? Who are those that ones that you've traded with in the past that you've sold a service or a product to? And, and where do they sit in the business in terms of their core interaction within the business? Then to the left hand side, we have our new generation customer. So who is going to be the customer that you're going to be interacting with in the future? Who's going to be buying from you? Who's going to be uh, interacting with your service? Who is going to be the customer of the future? And then to the right hand side, you have an influencer base. So who is in or around your business, both from a staff perspective, partnership, a client, a supplier perspective that can help influence on behalf of your business. Now, when we talk about influence, we are talking about those individuals that either have high profile, high engaged data, high networks that you can help, that can help your business and help get your business message across. What we then have to absolutely do is drill down as to what is the emotional connection with those core customers, those new generation customers and those influencers, because there will be different motivations for each of those individual groups of customers that we're trying to target. The core customer is the immediacy if they've been buying and trading with you or experiencing your services. New generation customers, you're, you're looking at different um, buying habits, different mindsets brought up in different generations that will definitely mean that they interact and what they're looking from for a bit from a business will be different to your core and your influence will be looking to build partnerships as to why they should trust and influence on your behalf. Once we understand who we're targeting and why we want to target them and what emotional connection, and I really urge you here to think beyond sales. This is not about selling to an individual, selling to an organisation. This is about building a relationship with that potential customer or existing customer. And that is drilling down from your purpose into the emotional connection. We then need to identify what the route, right route to market is. And there are multiple routes to market now. Uh, we are very, very lucky in the industry that we now have within the marketing channels and assets that we have available. There's a huge route to market. What we need to make sure is that it's absolutely right for our target audience, but we also need to make sure it's right for our business and that we're able to show a return on that channel or channels that we're looking to use. Digital channels are becoming more and more sophisticated. They have their... Uh, downfalls in that they can be unpersonalized and there can be a huge amount of wastage but if we're clever in understanding who our target audience is and understanding their data then we can actually drill a much more meaningful message into our future target audience as well so just for a couple of minutes i'd like us um i'd like you to do a little bit of work i just would like you to write down the numbers number one number four number five and number five so that's one, four, five, five. Should do it higher. One, four, five, five. So Darren, I'm not going to drill you and interview you like Lindsay did a couple of weeks ago. I'm actually going to talk you through the rationale, but I'm talking on behalf of Lindsay, uh, Darren's um, founder, a business partner. Lindsay Boyd teaches um, and is currently in the program of teaching campaigning. And I just want to share some of that insight with you because it really helps you break down how you need to campaign to your target audience and then it helps you identify which channels that you need to utilize so within any campaign you will have one campaign so you identify what your macro campaign is what is the the, the emotional engagement the purpose that it's founded upon and what are we trying to evoke within our target audience what kind of action are we trying to evoke with our, in our target audience? So we identify what our campaign is. We can have multiple campaigns running at the same time. You can have macro and micro, but in each instance, we brainstorm in the same way. So it's one campaign. Then we look at the assets within the business that allow us to take that campaign to market. So within any business, there's four assets that we'd like you to scrutinize. That is your automation asset. So how much data do you have on your existing client base or what data do you need to get? 
and where is that data stored and how effectively are we able to use that? If we have zero automation in place, it's not a problem. We have a basis to build from. If we have some, we can make it better. If it's very sophisticated, we then know who we're targeting and with what message. So automation is one asset within the business. We also have social. Many, many businesses will have social networks. Um, it is the face online of our business. What we need to make sure that those social networks are active and engaging and relevant to the tone of voice. You will find that something like Facebook has a very different tone to Instagram to something like LinkedIn. So when we then look back, as I said at the beginning, who is our target audience? What's the emotional connection we're trying to draw? We will have a different level of communication and language we'd use in Facebook than we would in something like LinkedIn. So another asset that we have to utilize in many, many businesses is social. If you don't have a social presence, then we need to look to build that. If you do have a social presence, where and when are those interactions happening and how engaged is your audience? And that allows us to then be able to take a message to market. We have traditional marketing within a business. So who are we talking to internally and externally? And what are those current marketing channels that we have in place? And then we have sales activities within a business. So there's four assets that we would look to utilize across. Then we have um, a, um, a, an analogy. It's the B passive an analogy, but it's not spelled traditionally. So it's B P A S V. And that represents books, presentations, apps, videos, and sales tools. Now, what they allow us to do is then look at our assets, so our automation, social marketing and sales, and then what do we have as form of collateral or what do we need to develop that allows us to leverage off some of those assets? So books can be a, a book, Mr. Levy, um, author in himself would have a book, but we might have chapters of a book, we might have a foreword, we might have articles, features, content. Within presentations, we have traditional presentations, we might have webinars, we might have how to guides, we have presentations around the business, the service or the product that we're offering. We might have apps for those businesses that interact in an app basis, but we might have animations, we might have online content, a whole host of online activities that we can use to engage our audience. We have videos, are they corporate videos, are they personal videos, are they product videos? What do we have in our um, closet, so to speak? And then how can we make the most of those video assets in form of vlogs, blogs, splitting them into bite-sized pieces, extending it into a wider visit video base that then leads into a webinar or such like. And then what sales tools do we have within our business? Um, and where do those sales tools exist? And how up to date are they? Do they need changing? Do they fit with our purpose? Do they fit with what we're taking to market? And then we have to look at touch points. So there is absolutely no point taking one channel to market. You'll waste a huge amount of effort and it will be very, very isolated. In every instance, we're trying to instigate five touch points. And what you're doing here is you're thinking about your product, your service, and how are you going to interact with your customer potentially over five, a minimum of five different touch points. And what we look at there is an experiential touch point. So how can somebody interact with your product, experience it, experience your service or what you're offering? How can they interact with it and actually experience it for themselves? What do we have from a digital capability? What do we have in our website and how can we build the campaign out through the digital assets as well? What do we have as a hero channel? Do we have somebody within our partnership or that is a that's able to substantiate something for us, that's taking it to a higher good, to a wider engaged audience? Our hero channel is really important if we have someone that would advocate on our behalf. Then we have traditional. Is there a publicity angle we can take? Is there a news story in this? Is there a piece of PR? And then what else do we have in terms of partnerships around us? So just to recap, we always focus on one campaign. We look at the four core marketing assets that sit within a business. If you don't have them, we can build them, but you need to think about them. We then look at the collateral that we have available in terms of books, presentations, apps, sales tools and videos. And then we execute them across five different touch points. And then whichever route to market you take, you have a complete bank of collateral and interactions that will allow you to engage with that customer and that target audience. 
just seen the time and we've only got five minutes left. So I'm going to hand straight back over to Tim for questions, but I hope that's been useful. Great. Thank you, Belinda. Um, so just for the questions, if I summarise the top five takeaways from the presenters, uh, number one, this is an L-shaped recession. Uh, any talk of a V-shaped recession, frankly, is fanciful just at the moment. Number two, don't miss the boat. This is the time to review your business structures. And number three is get your business ready for September 21. You don't want to miss the boat that the growth is happening and you're still spinning wheels working out what you want to be doing. The time to start thinking about that and planning is now. Number four, ensure you have cash funds. And finally, from Belinda, make sure that you've got a number of channels open to you and you choose the right ones which are best for your particular business. So I've had a number of uh, questions come in. Uh, top one, I guess, was uh, expected. Uh, Jackie asked Darren, uh, what impact do you anticipate Brexit will have on the rebuild phase? Uh, well, Brexit is um, a long conversation, long gone, isn't it? Um, I was being asked uh, last year a lot about Brexit and what impact that will have on the economy. And at the time I said, uh, Brexit is just one pie in the puzzle uh, for me. And Brexit was going to have a natural knock-on effect throughout Europe. And at the time I said, this is going to trickle on into the recession and we probably won't be talking about Brexit too much next year, but here we are bringing it up again. Um, for me, uh, global pandemics and that supersede uh, local issues and Brexit to me is a local issue. I know it's UK relevant, um, but in terms, if you get a global pandemic and a global crisis going on, that kind of supersedes what I would call a local issue. Uh, Brexit, what impact does it have in local, what I mean by local issue is um, local businesses can be impacted on it. So if, you, if your supply chain of people isn't coming in from Europe and um, that could affect you but then that's superseded because of most of those examples will be hotels and all that sort of stuff who can't find enough stuff and they're being impacted by the global pandemic so I, I don't know I'd put global pandemic in front of Brexit Tim. Okay and on that subject a question from Peter how on earth can we predict what's going to happen until we have a vaccine uh, which is going to bring back the normality and people confident again to go out in a virus and germ-free world. Yeah, that's true. And yet, if you look at other pandemics that have happened, all you can do is look at trend lines. And uh, every other time we've had a pandemic within 18 months, they've uh, found cures and all that sort of stuff uh, for it. The last time we had the big pandemic, uh, the Spanish one, it was three years and it had washed through society without uh, the modern sciences that we have today. So the human race just obviously builds up its natural uh, defenses against disease. Um, what we don't know this time, obviously, is uh, without you know being too controversial, we don't know this time uh, what's caused this one. And so if this was um, if this is something that the science world can't fix in a hurry, then obviously um, then that will extend things. Um, economically, what does that mean? It doesn't change my chart. 18 months of flat and then the world will go into growth. What we'll do is we'll go into growth again around things like medicine, like finding cures. You'll find people who were employed in airlines are suddenly being redeployed and employed in other areas. So I don't see the economics changing, but I do see society changing a lot off the back of this. And that's what I meant by societal change in pandemic or wartime periods. Okay. And then a final question uh, from Sharon asking, which sectors are we seeing thrive in the current context and what are they doing differently? Well, I think um, personally, anyone, any of my clients involved in IT have done really well because they've been rushing to get people set up at home. So people were probably 70% ready for it and they then had to be 100% ready for it. And the other thing I've seen is anyone who was online or could quickly get online seems to have done very well. It's people who are offline, I think, who have suffered. So now, Mark, Mark, what have you seen in your client base, the ones doing well? I've, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen that actually some some people who had minor ppe lines become extremely successful um overnight um what else actually waste so waste and energy so um as as we saw early on lots and lots of uh, councils cut back on waste collection and um one of my clients 
has a has a piece of technology that can produce um, turn waste into electricity. And so what they've what they've done is they've managed to um, obtain lots and lots of different contracts to produce electronic electricity off of the waste that's been um, produced by households. Okay, lovely. So. Um couple of other questions. Yes, Jenny, we can send you that L-shaped recession slide. And Mina, yes, this webinar has been recorded and a copy is going to be coming to you by the end of the day so that you could read it again, because I think there was a lot of information packed into there. And if you're like me, there are some of these webinars which you actually need to go, go through and stop and start again just to, to take some notes on them because there's so much information downloaded. So definitely going to do that for you. Um, so just to wrap up, on the 18th of August, uh, we've got a free taster session for those who are interested in what they've heard today and would like to be part of what Darren has termed the L&D recovery program. The L stands for the L-shaped recession. The D is for driving into growth from 2021 onwards. And the taster session will tell you more about what is covered during our the live program, which is going to guide you through the next uh, 18 months or so. Um, and finally, the next webinar in this series is on 26th of August at midday, um, is even more ambitious as it looks at the next three to five years, um, rebuilding, reviving, stabilising your finances. So we're going to have a team looking at funding, corporate finance opportunities and trading internationally. I think we're just a couple of minutes over. So I'd like to thank Darren, Mark and Belinda for giving up their time being here today. I'd like to thank uh, all of you for tuning in and uh, seeing the webinar. I uh, we hope you got a lot out of it and hope to meet you all again soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.